My name is Aaron Ostland. I am a research extension specialist at NDSU in the soil science department. I also have the pleasure of sitting on the planning committee for the North Dakota Reclamation Conference. Uh, so you can blame me or, or thank me for the programming over the last day and a half. Um, I have the pleasure of uh, having a PhD student join me for this last uh, presentation on EM surveys. Uh, Beverly Alvarez Torres is a dynamic PhD student at NDSU, specializing in soil science with a strong focus in soil chemistry. Uh, she also has a focus in education and science communication. Her work focuses on innovative soil remediation research and leading the Soil Science Ladies Project, which aims to empower women in uh, soil science. Beverly brings a blend of technical expertise in environmental conservation and digital mapping, along with a passion for science communication to promote sustainable practices and engage audiences in so soil science discussions. And so I'm gonna get us started here. And uh, first off, I got a question for folks. Anyone seen one of these before? All right, so we have a few people that know what an, uh, an EM38 is, which is uh, one of the instruments that we're going to be talking about and its implications into uh, delineation associated with uh, brine impacted soils. And so um, it's, it's one instrument that is ultimately in this larger category of electromagnetic induction uh, survey um, methods. And it really helps in, in situations like this. And, and ultimately, the objective of today's uh, presentation is to empower reclamation specialists to use uh, apparent electrical conductivity for delineation of brine impacted or brine releases uh, and how the um, use of these surveys can, can be implemented in remediation management and planning. So just a little bit of background, uh, one of the primary concerns as far as environmental impact of releases of produced water um, is the, the salinity associated with, with brine. Um, and over the last uh, 15 years of development, we've really seen an increasing in ratio of brine produced per, per barrel of oil. Uh, so what, what used to be in, in early well development, uh, kind of a one-to-one -one ratio of, of oil to, to brine, um, we're now getting upwards to, to one to 30 in some cases. And so um, it's, a, it's a byproduct of, of the development that um, we experience in, in the Bakken and, and continues to be a, a concern as far as the, the environmental risk that it poses. Uh, basically, when we're talking about produced water or brine is what we're talking about is, is really old seawater back from a time when North Dakota was an inland sea uh, and the deposition of, of all of the algal and, and other uh, flora and fauna that ultimately turned into the um, the oil that we are after um, are, are all associated with this ancient seawater. Um, there's a lot of things in brine, but it is primarily sodium chloride. We're basically looking at a, a saturated solution of sodium chloride, so upwards of 350 milligrams per, per liter uh, of dissolved solids and, and a, an electrical conductivity exceeding 200 decisiemens per meter. And so what we're looking at is, is if we can be more efficient in that delineation process, um, ultimately that leads to uh, an acceleration of site characterization and uh, a more efficient remediation process. And so I'm going to pass the mic off to, to Beverly, and, and she's going to give a little bit more background on, on what soil salinity is and, and how we can understand uh, what EM surveys are actually telling us. Okay, well, yeah. Well, um, it's very nice to be here again, another year. So this year, let's talk a little bit about what is a salt and to understand the importance of why we need to delineate this situation into the soils, where a salt is, um, is basically a compound that have one cation, one anion, and they are held together by a ionic bonds. And typically they are formed when a acid and a basic reacts together and neutralizing their charge. So basically, um, can you move the, I, sorry, I can have it, thank you. <laughs> okay, so basically when you have salts into the soil, they are dissolved because we know that we have water into the soil. So when we have these brine um, spills into the soil, we are turning normal soils like this one 
into saline soils that sometimes um, they decrease the yield of our crops, as you can see here. Um, these photos are from Puerto Rico, so just to have something different to show here. And sometimes we will have um, sodic, sodic um, conditions that are very um, common absorbed in brine um, spills because as we know, the dominant salt um, in that um, produce water is sodium chloride. So in these soils, we, we can see problems like drainage because the sodium basically um, destroy the soil structure. And because of that, we lost connection between the soil um, capillars and that um, decreased the soil drainage. But we can also have like saline and sodic soils. These soils can have like empty spaces as you can see in the image. Um, probably that areas are dominated by sodium. But once we reclaim this soil, we need to be like very careful because that there can turn into sodic soils like really quickly once we drain the salts in um, from the soil profile. So they are um, very interesting, but also a little bit tricky to manage. But um, just to have a different um, perception into the reclamation side, we can also use the ratio between anions and cations um, into the soil to classify them and to select better um, remediation strategies. Because for example, in my PhD project, I am working with um, biopolymers and sometimes we can um, have better remediation effort if we know which is the anion or the cation dominant into the system in order to select the best um, components to do that. So here I have some image of the impact of salt on, on the land use and soil functions. First, and I think that the most important here in North Dakota is the decrease on available um, water into the soil because we are we we usually are worried about the yields onto the crop, but we need to remember that the plants and the animals they need water. So when we have salts in the soil, um, the water um, competition star between the salts and the soil, so um, we don't have um, available water for for the environment, um, living organisms. So after that, we will see some soil dispersion and pore plugging, especially in soil dominated by sodiums. And in this image, we can see how one soil aggregates just um, as well after um, adding sodium chloride into the solution. And that is, is causing um, obviously poor drainage. So to analyze the source salinity, it's pretty common to use um, soil saturated paste because it simulates the soil condition at maximum field, field capacity. Um, but also in the field, because we don't have the lab there, we usually use the soil um, water solutions because it's simple, it's fast, it's economically and easy to replicate. The situation is that no matter how easy is the soil water solution, we are we are observing a lot of variability in the ECA values because it's depending on the dissolution usage. So um, the preferred method and the recommended method is the soil um, saturate paste, but it's laborious. Um, it it um, it causes a lot of money. And it takes a lot of time and effort to proceed. So using the EEM 30A, um, you can reduce not just the labor, but as, uh, as well the number of samples and the effort in your delineation. So now Aaron will explain us a little bit more about how we can do that. Thank you for that background, Beverly. All right. So... This is an EM38 by Genomics. It is just one of the companies that ultimately produces uh, similar instruments that will be able to be used as a, a mechanism for conducting these electromagnetic induction uh, surveys. Um, ultimately, what they're doing is is the survey the the meter itself is emitting an electromagnetic. Uh, uh, current and then there is a sensor a, a dipole on there that can measure the voltage or conductivity coming back to the meter um, and so implementing these things in the field 
um, can look different depending on the application. Um, in some larger scale agricultural applications, you see side by sides with large sleds and you can cover a pretty good uh, area uh, of ground. Um, we, we choose a little bit different approach for most uh, surveys associated with delineation, because um, hopefully we don't have a quarter section of area that we're trying to determine uh, changes in, in soil salinity so that we can have an effective uh, delineation and, and management plan. Um, and so it is also as simple as, as throwing something like this over your shoulder as you're doing a site walk. Uh, and so it, it, it's a fairly um, limited uh, investment in, in order to get some very useful information. And so I'm going to take a couple slides here just to talk through some of the considerations uh, of what you want to understand about what this instrument is telling you about your about your site and how that can influence um, the steps that would be necessary for, for an effective uh, delineation of, of, say, like a brine contaminated site. Um, so just like any field instrument, uh, it's only as good as the calibration and, and understanding what the interactions with the physical environment it, it is, is trying to tell you. Uh, and so without, without effective calibration or understanding the, the potential interference uh, and understanding the factors of the environment that influence the, the number uh, that the EM38 is giving you, uh, it, it's going to be fairly limited. So um, we want to just cover a couple of the, the primary factors that will influence the accuracy of an electromagnetic survey. And one of the primary ones is soil moisture. So if you have a site that is going to have very uh, variable soil moisture across one side to the next, uh, the EM survey is going to be dominated by that, in, that factor of the site. And so for those cases, um, it is helpful for there to be a recent rainfall. You don't necessarily want a completely saturated soil, uh, but you don't want to be in a position where you have a lower landscape area that because of its topography or position on the landscape, the, the soil moisture is going to be significantly different than a ridge line. And so understanding that uh, when that last precipitation happened and, and how soil moisture across that landscape is at the time of the survey uh, is helpful in interpreting the data that you're getting from it. One of the early uh, applications of electromagnetic in induction surveys was to look at soil texture. And a lot of that comes back to the soil moisture. So different textures are gonna have different soil moisture holding capacities. And those discrepancies or changes across the landscape are, are going to be picked up by this type of a survey. Um, one of the unique things that, that can be exploited and utilized uh, is the depth of the electromagnetic field, which is going to be dependent on the specific instrumentation you're looking at. Um, in this case, uh, some of the older models will, will have a, a two different settings. So you have to kind of go uh, at two different times to determine how deep or how strong you want that symbol uh, signal. So you can look at uh, the conductivity within the upper half a meter or up to like a meter and a half. Uh, we're fortunate enough in the soils department to have a newer model that will do both of them at the same time. And it can give you that opportunity to, to have a sense of the vertical delineation, not just the spatial delineation of a spill, which might be helpful for things like uh, estimating excavation uh, quantities or, or getting after those things. Um, ultimately, what we're after is salt concentration, and it is a great tool for uh, understanding what the variability across a site is as far as salt concentration. And so that's what we're going to kind of focus on going forward. But some of the additional factors that you want to understand is is survey design and data processing. So uh, the most efficient way isn't to, in this case, walk along and just look at the number and try to take notes at the same time, uh, but to pair it with other technologies like data, data uh, loggers and GPS units, which the newer uh, units absolutely have those things integrated. Um, so it's as easy as having a GPS data logger, uh, Bluetooth communication with the device, um, which is what we're doing uh, in the photo on the left, which is actually an ag application of, of mapping soil salinity. Um, but you can have a simple sled if you don't want to be carrying that thing all over the place and pull it behind you, uh, hanging on to or integrating that GPS unit and collecting a spatial uh, data set associated with the, the survey. Additionally, uh, you kind of want to have an eye on the sky. And so if you think that it's going to take you the entire day to do a survey of that site, that is going to influence the numbers you're getting back. And so if, if it's nice and sunny in the morning, but you're still surveying when a, when a cloud comes through in the afternoon and drops some moisture, 
yeah, you might want to consider resurveying that area because those types of environmental factors are going to influence the overall uh, continuity and, and reliability of your data, um, as well as the humidity and, and vegetative cover. Uh, it's fairly, I guess, easy in, in a moonscape type situation like this or a freshly plowed field. Uh, but if you're trucking through um, the grasslands of Puerto Rico, uh, it's a little bit harder. You kind of have to deal with um, additional obstacles in and understand how that might influence the, the numbers that are coming from this. Uh, one other thing that didn't make it on the list is um, kind of user error. Uh, it is an electromagnetic survey. If you have steel-toed boots or you're taking your phone in and out or you have a big uh, keychain on your hip, those are things that you're going to want to understand. And, and it's mostly uh, thinking about being consistent with your approach, not necessarily understanding that uh, those things are going to have a huge uh, change in numbers, but they, they could influence it if you're changing your approach, like you change your shoes out halfway through the survey or, or you decide to leave your keys at the truck the next kind of lap you come around the site. Um, so understanding just like any field instrument the the variables that it's it's collecting and and how those uh, different environmental factors or or uh, characteristics of the site can influence the number coming out of there is pretty critical for the uh, uh, efficient and accuracy collection of that data and so ultimately once you're able to conduct a survey uh, in this case this is the um the the map that was produced following the picture where we are pulling the unit in the sled on a, in an agricultural uh setting um you have an opportunity to uh, pull transects and orientation uh collect that data and produce a a, a continued a continuous spatial geospatial um uh map of an area and uh, a lot of times that comes down to utilizing uh, statistical models like Krigging in order to make a continuous map and, and zoning areas out. And so understanding kind of what the high end of, of the readings are, what the low end readings are, and then appropriately giving uh, a, a breakdown to, to then um, map your entire area out into zones. Um, there are opportunities to go from what this is calling, what this number is giving you, which is an apparent uh, soil conductivity into other EC meter uh, um, metrics, uh, but it, it's probably not something I would recommend for delineation of, of brine, pack, brine impacted areas. We should probably be considering it more just as a zoning tool. Where is our hotspot? Where is our low, uh, our edge of delineation? And how can we use that information for uh, kind of the next steps in the process? Um, which then comes into uh, play with um, kind of the, the soil uh, extraction and, uh, and actual electrical conductivity of like a saturated to paste or a one to one to five soil solution uh, for then getting at maybe a number that would be more in tune of making decisions uh, based on like a regulatory compliance type of situation. So this is kind of what the raw data looks like uh, once you're walking the site. And so that's me meandering across an area that had some uh, vegetative impacts, trying to understand uh, what's going on on that site. Um, and so from there, uh, we're able to then utilize a, a Krigging and, and produce a map more like this, where we are breaking it down into four different zones based on that apparent electrical conductivity and utilizing those zones to then dictate where we take grab samples. And so they're fairly small, but um, from here, we basically, instead of what might have been taking 20 samples across a, grid, a gridded format to try to delineate this area, through a simple walking of the site with an EM38, uh, a simple three three samples from each one of those delineated zones gives us a really good idea of, of what we're working with as far as a site characterization of where those impacts are uh, the highest and, and kind of where are we getting to the point of, of more of a background uh, electrical conductivity. Um, and so a lot of times we end up calling this uh, um, uh, the zoning following a Krigging of, of the data that's coming from the electrical, uh, apparent electrical conductivity. <clears throat> um, there is opportunities, like I said, with the newer models to do a, a, some of the vertical components. And so a lot of times you can get two or three maps out of a, a single pass and, and giving you an idea of what's happening below the surface as well, which, which can also be utilized uh, for determining what a, a 
a next step for preliminary um, uh, investigation might look like for grabbing um, soil samples to validate the delineation process. Um, it can go as far as, as dictating at least early uh, remediation protocols. And so if you are in a situation where you have like an irrigation system or tile drainage, um, you're gonna wanna pay attention to how, what that is doing to soil moisture, because those things are gonna pop up on, on your variability from the electrical magnetic survey. But it also might give you a chance to say, okay, if I only have limited resources and I am, I'm approaching this site uh, for the first time following a spill, where do I wanna go put my resources first? Um, and just making that overall initial steps of remediation reclamation that much more efficient and responsive. Because uh, honestly, this doesn't take a whole lot more work than just your initial site walk. Uh, yet you can come out with a lot more information to be uh, efficient in your next steps for, for um, the remediation process, including looking at uh, some of the other work that we're doing in, in our soil reclamation laboratory of like looking at salt tolerant species and determining where those things might be appropriate and where they might not be appropriate relative to more traditional methods of kind of dig and haul um, or, or the use of, of amendments in some cases as well. And so that's my our introduction to the use of electromagnetic uh, induction surveys for mapping soil salinity and, and how those things can be integrated into the delineation process of, um, of a brine impacted site. Uh, and so I'd like to thank Beverly for, for joining me and we can take any questions that you guys might have. Yeah, thankfully, I don't have to go back to my office. Um, it's a pretty handy tool in that as long as you have a modern computer, you can pull it off. If it can run ArcGIS, then no problem. You got it in. It is going to be determined on the unit you're using. So this one is from Genomics. They have their own uh, data interpretation and conversion software. Uh, it's a pretty simple package, but basically it's turning uh, the numbers that are being reported by the unit um, into something that can be used in a G GIS database or platform. And so uh, it kind of in this case, it's a three-step process. You take it from the raw data into a... a uh, geolocated um, data data form. Uh, most of the time I end up having that go into just a simple Excel sheet where we have longitude, latitude, and then the associated electrical conductivity number. Um, and you can change the frequency. So if you're having it ping every second or every half a second, that can kind of dictate if you're going to have 15,000 lines in that Excel or, or, or less. And that might or might not uh, allow you to actually pull this off in the field, depending on the size of the data set in the survey. Um, but once you have it in that kind of geolocated Excel format, that's really easy to pull into like an ArcGIS and use their Krigging tools uh, within that GIS platform to produce a map like I was showing. And so in that case, that's, that's the pathway we do. Um, and it might have a little bit of a learning curve because dealing with different uh, file um, file types and the conversion of those um, can can be hit or miss depending on uh, how experienced you are with it. But I, I promise if I can figure it out, you guys can figure it out. Any other questions? Yeah, in back. So it's definitely not perfect, but uh, and it's going to depend on the unit. And so uh, I have the most experience with the geno genomics um, units. And in, in the case of the newer one, uh, it has two levels. One is a roughly a, a half of a meter deep and the other one can go a meter and a half, uh, or you can convert it to, to a half meter and one meter. Um, and so it is only, we are still talking only feet down. We're not going to be chasing things really far, but it, in comparing those two maps that uh, it will produce, it can give you a little bit better of a sense of um, are things moving differently subsoil versus topsoil uh, and, and how you maybe want to uh, design your next step of, of sampling based on that. One more, yeah. Yep, so that's the, the critical part. Basically we use this to, to tell us where and how many samples we need. And so almost always we end up uh, zoning it out, grabbing um, samples from topsoil and deeper uh, from each one of our soil samples. And so in, in the case of the map that I showed, we ended up just grabbing three three grab samples from one from each one of those zones, uh, a shallow and a deep. 
coming back, running saturated paste, and then running that through both an ICP OES as well as a, an ion chromat chromatography in order to get uh, specific ion and cation concentrations. That way, you kind of have to go that additional step to be able to have any meaningful numbers um, to, to make management decisions on, on whether or not certain actions are necessary on a regulatory compliance or not. So it's more just how can we be a little bit more efficient to get to that point, to have those lab, lab numbers, to make uh, good decisions. Yeah. Well, if you are... Well, the most important part in the number of samples that you are taking from these surveys is based on the resolution that you are looking in your map. If you are looking for a high resolution, you will need a real number of samples, like more than three, nine. So um, the USDA ARS, they have a model that is um, ESAP. So basically there, um, they have a couple of models where you can um, like determine the soil sampling design based on your ECA values. And you can also like calibrate the signal using that models. So it's depending on what you are looking for. If you are looking for something that will be used for decision making in the community, you will need more soil samples because um, probably you will need more. Um, how was the word that I used? I forgot that. <laughs> the resolution of the map. Yeah. So. Okay. Thank you, guys. And with that, we're going to wrap up the 2024 North Dakota Reclamation Conference. I do want to take an opportunity to thank our sponsors one more time. Uh, so thank you to Meadowlark Environmental, 2X, Stantec, KC Harvey, BNI Coal, Chisex Seed House, Midwest Erosion Control, Bar Engineering, and Martin Construction. Without their support, we wouldn't be able to pull this conference off. Um, and I thank you guys for your attendance. Uh, when you get back uh, out of the uh, back home or back in the office, please take a moment to answer the email from Miranda Meehan and fill out that survey so that we can get some feedback from uh, the, the conference itself. And if you are here for Chase's discussion uh, at the beginning of this last session, we are asking that you participate in his survey. Uh, we're just looking to gather information on perspective of reclamation um, happening here in, in North Dakota. It will really help him uh, in his uh, PhD um, analysis of, of where we can be more successful in, in reclamation in North Dakota. So it would be greatly appreciated if you took a couple minutes to fill out each one of those surveys. Thank you all for coming and, and safe travels home.